Lord, what will thou have me do? With this prayer began one of the greatest revivals in American history. This revival from 1857 to 1859 has become known by many names, most commonly the prayer meeting revival. A revival it certainly was, for as William Arthur stated, a great number of people across the nation received salvation, creating a new environment. The prayer meeting revival revealed people's need for God, granted America blessings that affect the nation to this day, and served as a model and inspiration of how God can revive America again. The number of works concerning the prayer meeting revival could be either considered many or few. Many newspapers wrote about the revival, and several sermons and books of the revival have been preserved, so a good deal of primary information exists. However, comparatively few articles and books have dealt with the subject over the years, with seemingly increasingly fewer numbers as time has progressed. Usually, its main treatment is a paragraph or two in a longer work. Nonetheless, the historiography has remained consistent over the time, as nearly all sources recognized America's need for revival in the 1850s and noted the level of organization of the revival. Sources also frequently have related the prayer meetings to the Civil War, but rarely to anything beyond the 1860s. In short, few have sought to examine how the prayer meeting revival could relate to America in the post-Civil War era or, more relevantly, to the modern day. The America of 1857 faced troubled times. According to Van C. Christie, the country grew rapidly during the 1840s and 1850s, mostly due to immigration leading to work shortages and race riots. The debates over slavery had grown so heated, some could already sense the Civil War about to erupt. Then, not long after churches began hosting prayer meetings, in October 1857, a bank panic ensued. As the economy took a downturn, businesses closed and many faced unemployment. Frank Beardsley argued that the bank panic did not necessarily cause the revival. One could also argue, though, that economic hardship caused some to seek Christ. Spiritually, many people felt disillusioned with Christianity after William Miller's inaccurate predictions about Christ's return about a decade earlier. Many turned to other false teachings instead. David O'Beal and Craig Jennings in their separate works described a spiritual lethargy in both churches and schools. Jeremiah C. Lanfear, a lay missionary for the North Dutch Church in New York City, knew the world needed God's transforming power. He persistently tried multiple methods to win the souls, but nothing seemed to work, leaving him discouraged. In his discouragement, he prayed a simple prayer, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? According to Malcolm McDowell and Alvin L. Reed, Lanfear decided that prayer meetings would help businessmen, who often looked troubled. On September 23, 1857, he held the first noontime prayer meeting, only six people came that first week. However, the next week, 20 people showed up, and after that, around 40 people. The meetings became daily, and other churches began holding similar meetings. Unintentionally, from Lanfear's perspective, a revival had begun. The revival spread rapidly, reaching not just around the nation, but even around the world. Churches and religious buildings could not contain the numbers who attended. The churches found other places to meet, police and fire departments, theaters, tents. Dan Graves mentioned the YMCA. The March 20, 1858 New York Times, they added bank directors' rooms and schoolhouses. According to Christie, pastors received summons to come aboard ships overtaken with revival simply by nearing America's shores. Unfortunately, the South did not experience as great of a revival, perhaps because of their preoccupation with the slavery question, according to Beardsley. The revival affected people from all walks of life. The prayer meeting revival has been nicknamed the businessmen's revival, but it affected more than that class of people, although indeed many shops and other businesses closed during the noon hour for prayer. College students also experienced revival. William C. Conan recounted how many students at Yale College found spiritual renewal, including those formerly greatly opposed to Christianity. The May 12, 1858 Weekly Vincennes Gazette told that nearly half the student body at Princeton had found spiritual renewal and said that prayer meetings at the college in Lafayette, Indiana, indicated the revival may soon reach there. The revival crossed religious, racial, and cultural boundaries. Prayer meetings were officially non-denominational, no matter what church hosted them. In some places, blacks and whites get alike gathered, unsegregated, according to Conan. C.N. Wilbur noted that under John Lafayette Girardeau, slaves in Charleston, South Carolina, also experienced revival. Jennings theorized that the revival among the blacks might have prevented slave uprisings. According to the April 8, 1858 National Era, some did not think the prayer meeting revival would help the slaves. Perhaps, though, God used the then-looming Civil War as his delayed answer to those prayers. Conan also told how Jews joined in prayer with Christians, some of them receiving the Messiah into their own hearts as a result. 
As time passed, the revival spread to Canada, according to Conant, and according to Graves, to the United Kingdom, to Europe, to South Africa, India, to Australia, and to the Pacific. Newspapers and telegraphs helped spread the revival. According to Graves, an edition of the New York Herald in February 1858 lengthily covered the revival. Then in April, the New York Tribune dedicated an entire issue to the revival. Graves also spoke of the revival traveling to the West, thanks to the invention of the telegraph. And Jennings stated that at certain hours, telegraph companies allowed businessmen to send free messages about the revival. Lay people organized and led the prayer meeting revival. Because of this, according to Beardsley, pastors had time to dedicate themselves to preparing Sunday sermons for their growing congregations. The prayer meetings were not simply an hour sitting in a room praying. Although people could come and go as they pleased during the meetings, organizers developed an order of service recommended for the hour-long meetings with set times for each event, an opening hymn, a prayer by the service's leader, a scripture reading, a time for prayer and exhortation, a time of testimony, a closing prayer, and a closing hymn. Ian Randall implied this level of organization may well have been because businessmen used to conducting other types of meetings often organized the prayer meetings. The results of this revival were astounding. First, it affected Mar America socially. According to Mark A. Knoll, after the 1857 bank panic, crime did not increase as it normally does during times of economic downturn because so many people had the peace of the Holy Spirit inside of them. Some shopkeepers, Beardsley stated, even disposed of their stocks of alcohol. No remarked that people found ways to help each other without involving the government, and they experienced a greater sense of community because of the revival. Secondly, the revival affected America as the Civil War broke out only two years after the revival ended. Perhaps America would not have been able to endure the war if so many of its citizens had not first received spiritual renewal only a few years earlier. Furthermore, according to Christie, about two million soldiers, both northern and southern, received salvation during revivals that happened during the Civil War. According to Jennings, the Christian unity caused by these revivals later helped heal the nation during Reconstruction. Above all, the revival affected America spiritually. Beardsley remarked that lay people became more involved in the church. According to Graves, families began to have daily devotions, and pastors again preached the gospel rather than giving intellectual lectures. According to Noel, people felt burdened to evangelize urban areas and send missionaries overseas. Jennings mentioned that many people gave generously to philanthropic and Christian causes, helped found Christian schools, relief agencies, and gave to missions. Beardsley's and Arthur's work stated that people also felt more unified with believers from other denominations because of this revival. Most importantly, though, was the number of souls destined for heaven because of the revival. According to Christie, people praying for the salvation of loved ones also witnessed to their unsafe friends and family. Unsafe people began to attend prayer meetings and, in many cases, prayed the sinner's prayer. Estimates vary, but most agree up to a million people received salvation in a time span less than two years. Christie compared this to 11 million American citizens receiving salvation within a two-year time span today. America Today Needs Revival. Jeremy Griffith stated in a May 2018 interview, the nation has become, quote, driven by humanistic desires and preferences. A revival would usher in the spirit of God, end quote. James W. Alexander's sermon reminded his congregation that God cannot bless a nation unless the people turn to him, corroborating 2 Chronicles 7:14, King James Version. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Some Christians have grown lukewarm, like the Laodiceans in Revelation 3.16, and claim such a revival is not possible. In contrast, Griffith stated, Revival, quote, should be the natural state of the local church, end quote, if believers' hearts align, quote, with the passion and prior priorities of God, end quote. Arthur's sermon agreed, saying believers should desire to see as many as possible saved. The prayer meeting revival blessed those who experienced it, and it blesses America today. Each revival in America has ensured that Christians remain in America, allowing God's blessings on the nation to continue. As America becomes increasingly pluralistic, Christian pastors, scholars, and lay people would do well to look back on revivals such as the prayer meeting revival, not just to understand the historical impact, but to inspire modern-day believers to yearn again for the revival of souls. May Christians indeed hope for another revival in America. It is not a hopeless wish, but a faith in the promise that God can do again what he has done before.